Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. Each month, we share firsthand accounts of survival during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Peter Stein share his firsthand account of the Holocaust with us. Peter, thank you so much for agreeing to be our first person. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for producing this. Thank you for the wonderful Holocaust Museum staff. And thank you for all folks watching this interview today. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. You have so much to share in a short hour, so we'll go ahead and get launched if that's okay. Peter, you were born September 22nd, 1936 in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Before we turn to your early life, World War II and the Holocaust, please tell us about your parents, Victor and Zdenka. Well, uh, they met in Prague uh, in 1933, 34. Um, they were traveling the same road uh, from Branik to, uh, towards Pilsen. My dad was driving, my mother was walking, and he offered her a ride. Uh, they started dating. They discovered that they liked to dance and they liked the outdoors. Uh, they fell in love and they married in, uh, in a, uh, not in a temple, not in a church, but town hall in the center of Prague. And there they are on their wedding day. Peter, your father was Jewish and your mother Catholic. Was their marriage unusual at that time in Czechoslovakia? Well, uh, it was uh, not, it was unusual for the country, but not for Prague. Uh, Prague that had a number of Jewish families who were assimilated and their sons and daughters uh, fell in love with uh, non-Jewish others, uh, Christians, Catholics. Uh, and in fact, the inner marriage rate in Prague was one of the highest in Europe before the Hitler occupation. In, in both your parents had college educations. What did they do to earn their living? So my mom was a teacher. She was an office manager. She was a translator and an artist. She loves to paint still life. We have lots of flowers and fruits uh, hanging in several of our rooms. My dad was the manager of Bentwood Manufacturing Company that also made sporting goods. Anything with Bentwood, rocking chairs, uh, skis, tennis rackets, you name it, were made there by standard. Uh, and he was particularly proud of a record, tennis racket, called the Standard, which was used by one of the four mu French musketeers who played in the Davis Cup in the 1930s and 1940s. Mm. Peter, um, I know you had a large extended family. Um, tell us about your extended family. Well, as I understand, in much of the time before the Nazi occupation of 1939 was spent by my family with either his brother or his two sisters uh, or uh, his mother's nine siblings. So my grandmother, that is my father's mother, came from a large family. 
and a lot of socializing went on. And I have a lot of photographs of me with various members of that family. So they were embedded. They were part of that larger family group. Eddie, how, how, in total, how many family members do you think there were in Prague? Oh, I, I, I think easily 30 plus. 30 plus. Yeah. yeah. So you uh, most up, married, yeah. most had children. Uh, later on, the question was, do we stay or do we uh, leave? And some left and some stayed. Uh, but that was a, a discussion that went on once the Germans and, occupied Prague. And, and we definitely want to come back to that in a, a little bit, Peter. At the time of your second birthday in September 1938, war seemed imminent. At the time, it was averted, but those events had a huge impact on Czechoslovakia and on your family. Please tell us about that. Well, I don't know if I had a second year birthday, but it was interrupted by my dad having to put on his first lieutenant uniform and go off uh, to uh, the Sudeten area. Uh, what happened was that uh, when the country was started in 1918, the Sudeten area had a heavy concentration of ethnic Germans, people who spoke German, but who were Czech citizens. Uh, some of the members of that group uh, urged Hitler to liberate them. And Hitler wanted a pretext for invading the country. So he threatened to uh, occupy the Sudetenland, which had about three and a half million people. It had a lot of the uh, important factories and buildings in the country. Uh, so it looked like there would be a war between the Czechs and the Germans. Major problem was there were 70 million Germans and about 7 million Czechs. Mm. There's my dad uh, in this lieutenant uniform. He was called up. Uh, then there was a meeting in Munich where uh, England and France capitulated to Hitler. Uh, it's sometimes called an appeasement. And the West agreed to let the Germans come into the Sudetenland and occupy it, and they signed the Munich Agreement. However, six months later, German army was back to occupy the entire country. And, and when your father, as we see in this picture, when he was called up, um, when that happened, he was demobilized, or he was demobilized, I guess, pretty quickly after that, right? Yes, he was in the reserve. Of course, a lot of the Czechs were very angry that they were not allowed to fight the Germans, uh, despite the uh, number differences. Uh, the border between Czechoslovakia and Germany was heavily uh, fortified with uh, weapons. Uh, tanks, and so uh, the veterans were very upset. Some later joined the underground. Some, like my uncle Kurt, joined the Czech army in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and came back to fight the Nazis that way. As you're describing what happened to the Sudetenland and, and the Munich Agreement that uh, was uh, put in place at the time, in March 1939, Nazi Germany violated that Munich agreement and occupied all of Czechoslovakia, the Czech lands, including your home city of Prague. What did the German occupation mean for you and your family? Sure. And here's a photo of Adolf Hitler in the castle, the, the seat of the Czech government. He's reviewing his uh, German soldiers. Uh, it really meant quite a change. The change didn't happen immediately, but uh, the, the, the German presence was there. Uh, 
all the street signs were now in German as well as Czech. Uh, German soldiers were seen all around the, the town. Uh, I was uh, less than three years old when this happened, so mm -hmm. I didn't really understand that part, but it was understood by my parents and by my relatives. Uh, when, this, when this happened, Peter, when the occupation occurred, do you know if your parents at the time thought it was a temporary thing, that the occupation uh, would, would, would be over before long? And, and did they give much consideration to leaving? You began to mention that a little while ago. That's an important question. My understanding is that there were meetings among family members and uh, uh, most of them decided, including my parents, decided to stay in Prague, thinking the, uh, you know, how, could, how bad could it be? Mm -hmm. uh, some had hoped that Hitler would be overthrown by the Germans, that he might not last. But some members of this extended family left. One uh, pair went to Chicago another couple to New York, a third couple to Palestine, a fourth couple to Australia, mm. uh, and a fifth couple to Canada. So there was sort of, they were part of the diaspora, uh, the Jewish diaspora of people who felt it was time to leave. Uh, those who left survived, those who stayed behind for the most part were killed in the concentration camps. Peter, as you mentioned, when the occupation occurred, you were just three, but as you started going to school a bit later, did, did Prague feel like a different place to you as far as you recall? Was there, were you aware of the Nazi occupation? Well, it really wasn't until I started going to school at age six uh, because there were Germans in the streets, on the trains, all the signs. Uh, my school was in downtown Prague and the German banners were flow, flowing all downtown, uh, large swastika banners hanging from windows. There were pictures of Hitler mm -hmm. posted all over. And of course, German was heard uh, as much as, as I heard Czech. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, to me, uh, sort of confusing because uh, I didn't know who all these German soldiers were, uh, but we learn about them uh, by going to school and, and by some other things. Peter, according to the Nazis' Nuremberg race laws, your parents' marriage was categorized as a mixed marriage and you were classified as mixed race or Mischling. This had major implications for you and your parents. Please tell us what that those designations meant for you. Sure, the mixed marriage is exactly what it was. Um, it, uh, it meant that my dad had to wear uh, the yellow star on all his clothing and that he was uh, prohibited from doing a number of things, including uh, taking the tram, public tram. Mm. Uh, only one car per tram was allowed uh, to have Jewish passengers. Uh, and it just changed the whole tenor of it. Mm. Uh, I was five years old when that law was passed. But because I was a Michelin of, of mixed blood, I was never required to wear the yellow star, uh, nor were my cousins who were in the same boat. They had the Catholic mother and a Jewish father. Mm -hmm. They never wore stars either. Uh, but uh, it really labeled Jews as Jews. Uh, it made it clear to anyone on the street that you're watching someone who's Jewish. Right. And uh, uh, that was a, a, a difficult thing for people to deal with. I think you shared with me that um, you remember your 
your mother sewing the yellow star on your father's clothing. This happened uh, in late 1944. Uh, I, my bedroom was off theirs and I, I was looking through the keyhole and I saw my mother sewing the six-sided yellow star onto all of his outer clothing. Mm -hmm. My dad was sitting at a small desk in their bedroom going through papers. And I imagine pulling out the what he, uh, papers that my mother needed to see. And it occurred to me much later that could have been the last time they would have seen each other because uh, later that night, he had to report to a second railroad station in Prague uh, to a train that would take him to Theresienstadt. And, and I know we're going to talk a, a little bit more about that in, in, a, in a few moments, I think. Um, in, fa in fact, in, in late 1941, uh, before the incident you just described, the Germans began rounding up Jews in Prague and transporting them to the nearby Theresienstadt ghetto, also called Terezin in Czech. In 1942, your paternal grandmother, Sophie, as well as other relatives were sent to Theresienstadt and other camps and killing centers. Why was your father not sent to Theresienstadt at that time when so many other members of his family were? So we come back to the Mishlinger label. Uh, Jewish men married to Christian women, but also Jewish women married to Christian men were forced to do hard labor, manual labor. And my dad was part of a group that repaired roads and built some new ones and did other kinds of repairs. Uh, and to me, he was uh, a, a shadowy figure. Sometimes he'd be home. Most of the time he wouldn't. Uh, I really wasn't sure what he, where he was. But, uh, but it did save his life because, as you said, every member of his immediate family, that is his parents, two sisters and their husbands and uh, his uh, brother and his wife, were all sent to Terezin and from there either to Auschwitz or Mali Trostenets, which was a small killing camp outside of Minsk, uh, then the Ukraine, and now Belarusia. Uh, so it, it, it dramatically changed, but it, it really saved his life because had he been arrested in 1942, I'm sure he would have perished, mm -hmm. just like the rest of his family. So that, that, that his, his mixed marriage status um, saved him from that at that particular time. Peter, your, your grandmother, Sophie, was the first family member sent to Theresienstadt. In your book, A Boy's Journey from Nazi-Occupied Prague to Freedom in America, you wrote of a, quote, vivid memory of grandmother Sophie, end quote. Will, will you share that vivid memory of your grandmother, Sophie? So this is my lovely grandmother, Sophie Marcus Stein, with her husband, Joseph, my grandfather. Joseph died before the German occupation. Sophie had to move from a comfortable, uh, solid middle-class uh, home to a small apartment in the, uh, in the poorer section of Prague. Uh, she was 87, sorry, she was 78 when she was, uh, sent to Theresienstadt. I have a moving memory of her coming to our apartment, that is my parents and my apartment, carrying a chicken liver casserole. And the aroma was just hypnotic. You know, and I wanted to try some, and she put some of that on a, on a cracker for me. It was lovely. Uh, she and my parents went into the living room and when they came out after quite a while, they were all crying. Uh, and she came over to me, gave me a big hug and whispered, I love you in my ear. And it's the last time I saw her 
and it's the last time my dad saw his mother because several days later, she was on a train from Prague to Theresienstadt and wound up in the Hanover barracks of Terezin, where she died in 19 days, primarily because as a type one diabetic, all of her insulin and all of her medication was confiscated and she died what must have been a horrible death there in the summer of 1942. We have a photograph here from Terezin or Theresienstadt. And uh, this I took when I did a walking tour of uh, Terezin. The German slogan Arbeit macht frei was found on every single concentration camp. It says work will make you free, which is a typical Nazi euphemism. Of course, it won't make you free because you're working very hard and you're not getting enough calories to do that work. But there it was. And th this is the sign that all Jewish prisoners, men, women, and children saw when they entered Ter Terezin. It's Terezin in Czech, Theresienstadt in German. Peter, with your grandmother and other family members sent to Theresienstadt and, and then many or most of them then, or all of them other than your grandmother, Sophie, then transported to um, killing centers and, and other camps. At that time, did, did your parents or you know what happened to them? Have any idea where they had gone and, and what had happened to them once they were taken? As far as I know, they did not. Although they did get a card from Terezin uh, of a, uh, sorry, a, a small card printed in German saying uh, Sophie Marcus Stein died of natural causes uh, and the date. That's the only relative they knew anything about. Mm. His sisters and their husbands were sent, as I mentioned, either Auschwitz or Mali Trustinets. And as far as I know, my parents did not know uh, who survived. However, just a few days ago, looking at some papers here, I found and uh, some other receipts. Apparently, my parents were sending clothing to other relatives in Terezin. And that was allowed in 1942, 1943. Uh, and people who received the clothing send a note saying, thank you, I received the package. Mm -hmm. But that was the only communication that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, once they were sent to Auschwitz or elsewhere, that was the end of those communications even. Yes. Peter, your, your father's status of being in a mixed marriage uh, didn't spare him from doing hard labor, being forced to do hard labor, as you described, for the Nazis. And your mother was also forced to do labor because of her marriage to a Jewish man. What, what, tell us more about what this forced labor meant for your parents and for you. Well, it did mean you had to show up and, and you were doing work that you didn't normally do. Uh, mm -hmm. The men particularly doing manual labor my mother was sent to a, uh, was ordered to work in a German controlled textile factory, uh, making socks and underwear uh, during the day. And later on during the war, she worked at night. Uh, and I would remember that she'd come back often with blue on her hands from doing a particular task that in included. Uh, using ink on what she was making. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult for both. But at least my mother came home uh, at the end of every day. So you saw, you obviously, you, you, you had your mother there with you, but your father, he was gone. And um, yes, um, yeah. Did, with your father sent away then, it's just you and your mom. What was, do, do you recall what life was like for the two of you? Well, we missed my dad, but most of the conversations centered around the war, around what's happening, 
about other relatives. Uh, and uh, every Sunday, we went to my Catholic grandparents for a Sunday meal. And uh, so that that made it more real. I saw relatives, saw my grandparents, my cousins. But I missed my dad very much because he's someone that I used to hang out with. He, he introduced me to swimming. He introduced me to football. And he was gone. Gen generally speaking, what was the food uh, conditions like, the circumstances uh, with your mom needing to feed the two of you. I know you said that you were able to go have some meals with your Catholic grandparents, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I assume it was pretty meager. Pretty eager, meager rations, which got more meager as the war progressed. Right. Particularly things like meat, butter, milk were in short supply. And uh, my mom did the best she could. We had a lot of meals with potatoes and mushrooms, which I liked. Uh, but sometimes it was potatoes and broccoli, and I didn't care for broccoli. But I learned to love it by the time the war ended. <laughs> uh, my... Did, um, <laughs> will, will you say more about uh, the role that your Catholic grandparents played? Sure. So here's my uh, my grandparents, uh, Zdenka and my grandfather, Antonin. Um, she was a wonderful cook, and she was, no matter what the food shortages were, she would get herself into the rural areas outside of Prague and barter for a chicken or a piece of pork or something. Uh, she would bring either costume jewelry or money, and all of this was illegal. Nevertheless, she was determined to serve a good meal. My grandfather, uh, in his civilian life, oversaw a major uh, wood area uh, in Czechoslovakia and in Austria. Uh, he worked for Count von Schwarzenberg, whose house you'll see in the middle of Prague. Anyway, he was very interested in politics. So at the end of every Sunday dinner at six o'clock in the evening, I and my cousin Robert would go in to my grandfather's office. He would, he had a, 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 a cover uh, for the, for the table. So he'd spread the, uh, the cover and put black checkers in the places where the Germans had their lines, particularly with respect to D-Day. Uh, he had a map mm -hmm. that showed us uh, the five major landing areas. And then he used red checkers to indicate where the allies had been landing or advancing. Uh, and this is news he got from the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, every Sunday at six o'clock. So we'd get the sense that the Allies were moving and, and winning. However, the teachers in school, Monday through Friday, were ordered by their German supervisors to tell their kids about the advancement of the German army. So I experienced cognitive dissonance early on. But of course, I believed my grandfather and the BBC, but I was told never tell anyone uh, about what you heard. So silence was the operative uh, moment. And it was, it was actually illegal for your grandfather to be listening to the BBC, wasn't it? Exactly. It drove my mother crazy because he was hard of hearing. He would have the volume up full blast so you could hear it when we entered their house. And he always said, don't worry, everybody who lives here is listening to the same station. Well, they were all subject to arrest right. by the Germans if, if they were heard. You, you mentioned um, at school where it was a different story. 
during this time, you did experience anti-Semitism in school. Um, please tell us what happened to you at school and also a little bit about this photograph. Well, the teachers were great. I liked them. Mm. But I had a bully in the second grade. I think that's the next picture coming up. Uh, where uh, this is me in the second grade learning how to write. And here I am with the whole class. There's a, a circle around my head. And uh, sitting in front of me is a fellow named Joseph, who was the class bully. So he picked on different people. And for a while, he picked on me. And one day he told me, you know, your father's a dirty Jew. So I sort of grabbed him and tried to wrestle with him. He was stronger than me. I got a bloody nose. Principal told us, stop it. And they sat us, they sat me away from him. Uh, but that, that was uh, when I asked my mother, why did Joseph say that? She said, well, his parents uh, are for the Nazis. So he's uh, against the Jews and he's ex expressing his parents' point of view. Mm -hmm. One other thing about this photo is that we had two teachers, the gentleman to the right, Mr. Prokoska, taught us science and he taught us German. Miss Novak to the left taught us geography and Czech. And at the end of the war, she wound up going to Canada. One other piece that's missing from this photo is the front of the classroom. And the front of the classroom had the German flag with the Tsigheil and a picture of Adolf Hitler. So Monday through Friday, we knew who was in charge. Uh, even though Sunday I learned that the Germans weren't doing so well. And, and that was probably true in every single classroom, that yes. picture and the, the, the Nazi flag. Yeah. You, you also had a particularly frightening experience um, while you were on a tram. Can you tell us a, a bit about that? Sure. So this is the tram I took from the section called Branik, where we lived, to downtown Prague. It's about a 15, 20 minute train ride. I was sitting there reading a book, like a good second grader. Suddenly I notice a pair of boots in front of me, shiny boots, look up, green, gray uniform, look up again, and I see a gentleman, a, a soldier. I saw right away from the lapels that he was a member of the SS, and above his cap uh, uh, is uh, uh, the German eagle, and uh, the death symbols to, uh, above his cap. And in German, a brisk German, he says, get up and give me your place. And I put the book back in my knapsack, shaking and moved as far away from him as possible on the one car. I got off in the center of town, Vatsovsky and Amiesti, it's called. And when I got to school, Miss Novak saw how upset I was. She talked to me and she said, no, I thought he knew where my father was. Mm. And then I thought maybe I moved too slowly or maybe he followed me. He didn't follow me. She reassured me that, no, he just wanted a seat. He doesn't know that you're half Jewish. He doesn't know where your father was and she calmed me down, but it was a very upsetting experience for sure. That, that you've, you've, that's an amazing description you've just given from the eyes of a small boy at a, a very ominous figure and, 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 the, and the fear that you felt uh, at that time. Peter, in, in early 1945, the Nazis began deporting Jews who had been protected because of their mixed marriages including your father. Can, can you uh, share with us what you remember from that time? Sure. Well, I remember uh, the evening where my mother was putting uh, 
attaching yellow stars uh, on all of his jackets. That's when you were looking through the peephole at it? Sorry? That's when you were looking through the little peephole. And exactly. Watching. And then I opened the door and went in. Yeah. And my dad saw me and he said, uh, don't worry, I'm going on a business trip. I'll be back as soon as I can. And uh, I didn't ask, well, why are you taking all your overcoats and why this large suitcase? He walked me back to my bed gave me a hug and said, uh, just listen to your mom, be a good boy. Uh, and then he disappeared. And whenever I asked my mom, she had the same standard answer. He went on a business trip. He'll be back as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, we survived, uh, but we missed him. Peter, um of course, your, your grandmother, Sophie, and other family members had gone to Treisenstadt several years earlier and, 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 and were killed. And your grandmother, Sophie's case, died there at Treisenstadt. Did, what do you know of the conditions um, that your father uh, was under once he went to Treisenstadt? Sure. Well, just before I got to Treisenstadt, I do want to say that this whole area in, in the war, when the relatives were disappearing and there was a lot of chaos, uh, fear was my major feeling. I, re I was fearful of the Germans. I was fearful of the situation. Later on in 1945, bombings of Prague, just a lot of chaos. My dad is sent to Theresienstadt and put to work in the factory, Bentwood factory, no, wooden wood factory. Uh, and uh, he was working there. Uh, this is what he did Monday through Saturday uh, on limited. Uh, first of all, food was a major shortage in, in Terezin. There was not enough to, fr to fr feed people. So he'd have something that resembled black coffee which was really made out of chicory, maybe a piece of stale bread and a soup that mostly uh, led to diarrhea rather than any kind of satisfactory meal. So they were always hungry. It was also very cold. So the winter of 44, 45, he arrives in the, uh, early 1945, uh, there were no blankets. Uh, after the war, I went to see the dormitory in which he slept. And that was set up to house 40 people. When he was there, there were between 350 and 400 men. 10 was, times the number it was intended for. 10 times. Yeah. With no pillows, maybe one mattress, maybe one cover, freezing. Uh, full of cockroaches and uh, other vermin, unsanitary. It, it was it was a terrible situation, which people had to survive. Some did and some did not. Uh, uh, I, I think it helped that he spoke German because in several cases he overheard that something was going to happen somewhere. So he sort of made sure that he didn't appear there if possible. Uh, and so he worked with wood, wooden products and, and survived that way. With, with your father in Theresienstadt and in the late in the late winter of 1945 and as you said it was an incredibly harsh winter as soviet forces were advancing towards prague you and your mother were experiencing the direct impact of warfare including bombings and fighting that was taking place and as you started as you told us a little bit that just had to be such a frightening time for you as a, as a small child but it also had to be very terrifying for your mother as well um, can you say more about that time? Sure. 
Well, one of the bombings was of Prague in uh, February of 1945, towards the end of the war. But the number of uh, American, Canadian, and British air, uh, airplanes increased dramatically. Uh, they flew over Prague on their way to bomb Germany or bomb Berlin. So when we were in school, we were uh, we rehearsed what would happen if there's a bombing, uh, which was to leave everything behind, grab a coat or a jacket, and go downstairs to the basement. In this particular day in February, there was real bombing, and uh, we heard sirens, uh, fire sirens, the police uh, uh, wailing, uh, a lot of crashing, and Prague was being bombed. Uh, the same, this happened the same day that Dresden in Germany was bombed, saturated uh, by the U.S. And it turns out that one squadron of American pilots misread the map, they thought they were over Dresden and they were over Prague mm -hmm. because the topography is very similar. So something like more than 700 Czech, Czechs were killed that day. They hit a hospital, they hit a school. It was a terrible thing. And uh, we all went down to the basement. Uh, we sat on the ground floor. The younger kids were crying. The teachers were upset. And uh, as I was sitting there, I wondered how my mother was, knowing that my mother worked in a factory. And I thought, well, maybe the Allies were going to bomb the factory. That did not happen, but it just increased my anxiety. And there was a second bombing about a month later when we were at home and the house was near the river. On the other side of the river, there's some German munition plants. And the Allied hit them uh, with great force because we could just see the stream of colors and the explosions. And my mother and I wound up in a uh, uh, someone else's basement in the neighborhood uh, because it, there were rumors that the Germans were going to blow up the road that would prevent the American GIs, General Patton's Third Army, from coming into Prague. So more chaos, more turmoil. Uh, and we wound up in the shelter for a night or two. One of um, one of the chapters in your book is titled "Tinsel from the Sky." <laughs> um, very aptly named chapter. Tell us just a just a little bit about that. So we were, uh, the Allies kept dropping leaflets and bombs. And one of the things they dropped were these tinsels of foil wrapped together that were meant to make it more difficult for the German gunners to shoot at American planes. And we were playing out in the back of the, our apartment house. And I was with a couple of neighborhood kids and we found bundles of this aluminum uh, like tied together on the ground. And the kids thought, wow, let's collect these. Maybe there's a finder's, there's a uh, finder's fee, finder's reward. And we were all set to take all of this stuff to the German police. But the superintendent of our building, uh, saw us, he says, what, you don't, don't give them to the Germans, you'll get into trouble, just, you know, leave them here or give them to me, put them in a sack. Uh, and we were so excited that we were helping the Allied war effort by collecting these things. But uh, it turned out to be uh, a joke rather than an accomplishment. But it's still, uh, it's something that we could we could do. Peter, during all this time that you're describing now with your father at Theresienstadt, did your mother know anything about 
how your father was doing or if they, he was even alive? I don't think so. Hmm. Because towards the war, you know, the German effort was to keep fighting and uh, there were no more trains from Prague to, to Terezin. So as far as I know, my mom didn't. And uh, fortunately, her parents were around, so they were providing a lot of support, you know, uh, emotionally and also with food and uh, whatever we could buy. Uh, I mentioned there were increasing shortages, so we became vegetarians towards the end of the war mm -hmm. because there was no more meat to be had. But you just survive. You keep putting must mustard on the bread, and it wasn't that bad. Yeah, it's just a mustard sandwich, basically. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, as you, you described a couple of times, that there was a tremendous amount of fear for you. It was frightening, all that was going on. Do, do you have a, a sense of what your mother was feeling during all of that? My mother was very, very stoic and heroic. She would not complain. She would not fault anyone. She would just keep trucking. And uh, so she didn't spend a lot of time feeling sorry for herself uh, or certainly she was worried about her husband, my father, but she just kept trucking. Uh, that was the way she, she was very much like her father, just keep going. And uh, I, I don't know what her inner feelings were. Uh, that, that must have provided some form of comfort for you or reassurance to know that she was sort of just keeping keep it on going, as you said. Yeah, and, and concern about how I'm doing in school and how I'm getting to school and what's happening, keeping an eye on me, making sure I get fed. Uh, but uh, she just, she was a survivor too, even though she was never in a camp. Peter, the war in Europe ended on May 8th, 1945. Fortunately, your father survived Theresienstadt and he returned the very next day, which was May 9th. What was it like for your family to be back together again? And when did you feel that you were truly safe? Well, Bill, it was the happiest day of my life because uh, this was May 9th, the day after the war ended. And I saw a Soviet truck pull up near our house and two Russian soldiers got out and they were helping survivors, including my dad, out of the truck. He still wore the jacket that he wore when he left home with a yellow star. He was in reasonably good shape. He gave my mother a big hug and then he lifted me and I was so happy and so overjoyed. He let me carry the one bag that he had. Uh, so it was, it was wonderful. And here we are after the war uh, in the middle of Prague. What happened after the war is he tried to get in touch with as many cousins and relatives as he could. Some sadly were killed in the camps, but at least three different sets of relatives survived the Auschwitz camp, mm -hmm. including two brothers, the Marcus brothers, who jumped off a train heading back to Germany, jumped off in Czechoslovakia, and were in hiding for four months before the end of the war. So I began to get some sense of what the Holocaust was and what it did to members of my family. Peter, eventually you and your mother, and then later your father, left Czechoslovakia and immigrated to the United States. We have a video question from a student, Stella, asking you about your experience. So if, if it's okay, let's go ahead and hear from Stella. Hi, my 
My name is Stella Wilson from Hoover, Alabama. My question is, being only 12 when you arrived in New York, how hard was it for you to adjust to your new life? Peter Stella asks, being only 12 when you arrived in New York, how hard was it for you to adjust to your new life? Stella, it's a wonderful question. Uh, my first response is the bigness of Manhattan because we sailed into New York Harbor on November 3rd. The Statue of Liberty was lit up. Uh, downtown Wall Street was all lit up. This was probably uh, seven, eight in the evening. We got off the boat and we walked along 42nd Street and the traffic and the noise and the lights just were nothing I'd ever seen before. Then, of course, everybody spoke English rather than Czech. I wasn't quite prepared for that. And uh, when I got to school, I was put in the sixth grade at uh, Murray Avenue uh, Grammar School. Um, I wore what I had worn in Europe, which was knickers, that's a pants that are sort of cuffed at the bottom that was not worn by any other kid in the sixth grade. So I caught a lot of razzing and I wore an Eisenhower jacket that was Ike Eisenhower made by a Czech tailor. And my English was very poor. So the first several weeks were very rough. Uh, I misunderstood things. Uh, later on, I misunderstood being invited to someone's house for a party. I went. Problem was I was a day too early. And so the, those kinds of misunderstandings were difficult. The food was different. Uh, uh, the habits were different and the sports were different. Mm -hmm. So it was a time of year when Americans were playing baseball. I had never seen a baseball. Uh, I had been a good runner. They stuck me in right field where that's where you put the kid that's the least uh, skillful at baseball because you hope the no ball come to right field. So I, I, heard, I saw the ball flying in my direction. I ran, I ran, I ran. I grabbed it in my mitt. And I was standing on the pitcher's mound. So uh, the, the, the guys didn't know what to make of it. The coach said, good catch, Stein. Get back to right field. So. A, a, a baseball fan can truly understand that, that moment very much. Peter, uh, was it difficult for you and your mother to get out of Czechoslovakia and get to the United States? Boy, was that difficult, yes because the quota, each country in Europe had a quota in the US based on how many Czechs were in the United States in the census of 1890. Mm -hmm. and the answer is not so many. So it took us almost two years for my mother to get a visa for me and her to come to the States. Uh, and she had a countless trips to the American embassy, which was on the other side of Prague, and they wanted documentation, some of which was uh, waylaid or destroyed during the war. Mm -hmm. So it was a very difficult time for her. Uh, but eventually, uh, one day I came home from school and there were two eclairs, my favorite dessert, on the kitchen table. So I sat down, my mother said, ah, we got passports, we got visas to come to the States. And I said, where's the third one? Well, my father was trying to wrap up and take some money with him from Prague to New York. And he got into trouble with the Czech communist government by then. So it was just my mother and I who came here in 1948. My father came to New York in the spring of 1951. You know, after your mom had, and you had had periods of time without your father when he was 
at forced labor and then in Theresienstadt. Now here you are in the U.S. without your dad. Was there a real concern that your father might not get out of Czechoslovakia and be able to join you? For about a, a, a month, for about a year, there was correspondence. The, the communists didn't want to let him out. They accused him of being a spy for the United States. Uh, and I don't know how. Eventually, he got a visa from from the French. So he got on a train to Wiesenburg and lived there for about a year and a half before he got the American visa. So it was tough. And you asked about my mom. You know, she had to deal with all of this. She became a governess and a maid for an upper middle class family in Larchmont, taking care of two kids, cooking the meals, learning English. It, it was tough mm-hmm. for her. So uh, I'm grateful for what she did. So by the time your dad arrived, you and your mom, prob- you particularly probably spoke, you know, good English. Uh, so your father has to go through that same assimilation. He did. He did. Yeah. Uh, he, uh, both of my parents spoke Czech, German, and French, but not English. So he had to learn English. He went to one of these uh, uh, courses for newly arrived immigrants and uh, learned enough to secure a job with a Swiss firm selling office machines and equipment. So he, he landed on his feet, but that also took, took a while. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder how immigrants do it, but they do. They do. Peter, I, I just have one more question for you today, and that is, as we face an alarming rise in anti-Semitism around the world, as well as Holocaust denial and distortion, please tell us what we can learn from what you experienced during the Holocaust. Sure. Well, I'm, I fully believe in the importance of education and learning about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. Uh, an American uh, writer, well-known writer, William Faulkner, wrote that, quote, the past is never dead and buried. In fact, it's not even past. I realized what this meant when I was a young professor at a college in northern New Jersey, and I'm sitting in my office one day, and a number of uh, students come by, very upset, a young woman in tears, a couple of guys very angry. What happened? Can we talk to you? They were in a class where the teacher questioned the Holocaust and denied the numbers. The, the young woman who was crying had a grandmother who survived Auschwitz. She tried to tell the teacher, yes, there was an Auschwitz. Yes, my grandmother made it. And he refused to acknowledge her and said, well, that's one example. I need much more proof. So a week later, I and a colleague went to that class and we gave a lecture about what happened with the Holocaust, how the Nazis tried to eliminate all Jews in Europe, uh, about the concentration camps and the action of the allies, particularly in the US, to defeat Nazi Germany and liberate Europe. (laughs) And it was well received. And my feeling is that we need to continue to educate, to understand what fully happened in the Holocaust, and why there's an increase of anti-Semitism, excuse me, and Holocaust denial. So like it or not, the past is with us today. Peter, thank you so much for those closing words and for spending this entire hour with us. I know we only scratched the surface 
of what you could share with us, but your voice is just absolutely essential. Thank you for sharing it today. And I hope that you're able to do it in many different forums because we need to learn from and be educated by you and others who have firsthand, first person experiences. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Bill. And thank you everyone for listening and for acting. I'd like to take a moment to thank our donor. First person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. And I'd also like to invite you to join our next first person program next month. Thank you for watching today.